back to Beating a Dead Horse. As always, I am your host, Sean McKenda. And I'm your host, Jackson Keller. And this week, we are back with a media property that is just, let's say, relevant in so many fucking ways, it's not even funny. Uh, Most notably, we talked about Godzilla last week. This week, we're talking about Cloverfield. We're keeping that kaiju train up and running. Chugga, chugga, choo, choo, motherfuckers. But there's other subtle nuances that apply to our everyday life. There are giant monsters in these movies, whether you want them there or not, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the Cloverfield movies this week, specifically Cloverfield, 10 Cloverfield Lane, and the Cloverfield Paradox, which are all the mainline Cloverfield movies out there. I know before you big Cloverfield fans come at me, there's like ARG related stuff. We didn't watch any of that. We didn't read any of that. I know a decent bit just because I am a giant Cloverfield fan in my own right. Uh, just of the movies, I know a bit of the ARGs, but not a whole lot. Like I know Slusho's a thing, and I know that there's that Slusho is drilling underground and that might be the, the source of all this stuff, but like maybe not. It's all ambiguous. Like I know broad strokes that shit. Jackson, I guarantee doesn't even know that. No, I, I, I mean, I'm aware of the args insofar as I know that like part of what made the first movie so prominent was it's, it's marketing campaign and the args were part of that. Um, but like, as far as like the, the deep lore, yeah, I don't know any of that shit. <laughs> so, so it's important to keep in mind that we're only talking about those three main properties. I might delve into the args just a bit for here and there, but for the most part, I, if I do, I will probably be wrong anyway. Uh, so <laughs> Nice. Let's talk a little bit about Cloverfield. Let's, let's talk about our, our history with it. As I said, I am a huge fan. Uh, I, this is like the, the sixth time I've watched the first Cloverfield movie. This is like the fourth time I've watched 10 Cloverfield and the second time I've watched Cloverfield Paradox. Uh, the first Cloverfield movie is good. I would say it's great for me because I really, really like it. But taking a step back and trying to look at it more objectively... It's good. It's it's a it's a fine fine monster movie. Uh, it, it's executed well enough to be enjoyable, and yeah, it, it's pretty good. One big mark against it: T.J. Miller's there, and fuck that guy. Uh, Ten Cloverfield is genuinely a good movie. Ten Cloverfield is genuinely a great movie, like objectively. Uh, so high recommendation on Ten Cloverfield. Fucking fantastic and the cloverfield paradox i've watched twice because it eats shit and deserves to be flushed down the <laughs> toilet i mean as as mentioned last week we were supposed to do an episode on, on cloverfield paradox way earlier in the show when it first came out but it had that surprise drop and before i'd even watched it uh sean had texted me and was just like can we not <laughs> can we not do this <laughs> I really hate Cloverfield Paradox. Uh, you'll notice that I didn't actually explain what any of those movies really are uh, because the Cloverfield canon is very weird. Like, I can't just be like, oh, it's a big sweeping monster movie across all three of them uh, because it's not. Each movie is is very distinct and different unto itself. Cloverfield is, is a monster movie. Ten Cloverfield is like a, a, a suspense thriller. And then Cloverfield Paradox is, is garbage. <laughs> it's It's a... <laughs> sci-fi <laughs> horror thing akin to like Cronenberg's Event Horizon but it's not good it's not even Cronenberg interesting you know I think I think that sums it up pretty well yeah uh, Cloverfield series for those of you who are unaware more more of an anthology than a series I mean it's also kind of a series but we'll get into that um, but as as like an anthology I very much support anthologies I think that anything that gets kind of interesting unique like lower budget films and in front of people uh i think that's great and you know if that requires like having a brand that's more thematic more about motifs than like specific plot elements uh, i think that's wonderful so yeah i i i wholly approve i wish we had more anthologies kind of like this um because yeah you know and, and anytime we can get good work in front of people uh, advertising and, and branding doesn't have to be all bad necessarily. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this. Um, yeah, I, I don't have quite the same 
history with the franchise. I know I remember quite a bit of conversation about the first one back in the day. You know, I, I was in early high school, late middle school when it came out. I think it was like 2008, right? Well, regardless, I remember my sister was really hyped about it. And I also remember that it was a pretty divisive movie. Like a lot of people liked it, um, but it, it it also became became kind of a target for other people, like like a big disappointment for some people. I think a lot of that had to do with uh, the scope of, of of the marketing campaign and and what it turned out to be a solid monster flick. I I think people who were expecting more that's that's kind of what got their knickers in a twist about it. Um, also, it really brought shaky cam to the forefront for a lot of oh, people. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that was and that a lot of people of, hated it. Yeah, that that was that that was the other thing. This was when like people will sometimes talk about shaky cam now, but I feel like back in those days, like that was a real sticking point for people. People hated the fucking shaky cam. And I think that this this movie caught a lot of that. Uh, but so I, I didn't end up watching it, uh, m- mostly just cause I didn't really know what the movie was. Uh, I had heard like divisive things. So it just sort of skirted me by, uh, did, I think, I think I ended up seeing 10 Cloverfield before the original. I think that we, you, I watched the original with you after we had already seen the second one. I don't remember if it was before or after, but I definitely made you watch Cloverfield at some point because, as I said, I am a massive fan of the first Cloverfield movie. Yeah, so this is my second time seeing it. If it wasn't after, it was, like, immediately before. It was like, all right, let's 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 get you, let's get you up to speed, so sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, no, it, it, it's a solid film. I, I enjoyed it, uh, especially... Um, removed from like the the baggage of like the marketing campaign and stuff, I can appreciate it for what it is, and what it is 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 a solid monster movie. Uh, I, I think that the second movie, Ten Cloverfield Lane, is much much better. Um, but that's that's not a dig on the first one, and it, and it's not even that relevant of a comparison because they are indeed such different movies. Moving on to the second one, I guess. Uh, yeah, also my second time seeing it. Uh, Sean and I and uh, a few other friends back in the day saw it when, in theaters when it first came out. Uh, really, really liked it then. Uh, I think I like it even more now. This movie's genuinely a really, really amazing thriller. Uh, I, I, I have I have some qualms with like the last bit. Uh, but other than that, I think that for the majority of the runtime, it's nigh impeachable, like not nigh unimpeachable. Like it's it's slick. It's well paced. It's tense. It's got, you know, amazing performances, like really good characters, really solid, like setting and like, you know, memorable sets. Uh, it's 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 really, really, really fucking good. And I highly recommend if you have not seen 10 Cloverfield Lane, it is absolutely worth seeking out. You don't even need to watch the first one for what it's worth. If you just want to watch 10 Cloverfield Lane, go watch 10 Cloverfield Lane. You don't need to watch the first Cloverfield movie. All these movies stand on their own or fail to stand on their own (laughs) by themselves without the context of the other movies. I think Cloverfield, honestly, if you're listening to this, you have enough of an understanding of what Cloverfield is that your enjoyment of 10 Cloverfield will be about as equivalent as having seen the original Cloverfield movie. Honestly, just knowing that Cloverfield is a monster movie, you're good to go watch 10 Cloverfield Lane. Yeah, what would I recommend um like seeking out the original Cloverfield? That's that's sort of a tricky question because it's not like I I think the way that I'd put it is that if you came up to me and asked like I stumbled into, you know, a bargain bin copy of Cloverfield at Walmart the other day. Like, should I should I watch it? I'd be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that, like, it's an absolute must see that you need to, like, seek it out. I think it is sort of interesting for the weird place it has uh, for, like, you know, the, the conversations around it and the marketing and stuff. So, I, I mean, in that regard, if you're at all inclined to seek it out, yeah, it's 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 worth it's worth your time. It's a solid monster movie, but don't don't expect anything more than that. If you enjoy monster movies, like it's an easy recommendation, I would argue. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but outside of that, yeah, if you're just if you're like an average moviegoer and you're just looking for something to watch, yeah, I mean, I might recommend it to you, but like it, it might not necessarily be top of my list of things to recommend. Like I would need to know a little bit more about you, just because it is it's a very niche film that does again not a bad film, just niche. 
it's by no means like difficult to recommend but it's also by no means like an absolute must see either is is, is kind of how i think about it and ted <laughs> not not ted cloverfield paradox just the cloverfield paradox um this is the first time i'm see i'm seeing that that one i actually so last night before the, as of this recording i will rewatch both the original and 10 cloverfield lane back to back and i watch cloverfield paradox today so i'm coming relatively fresh um I don't think that's going to impact how I view the film that much because it's because <laughs> it's a hot mess. Um, it wasn't a completely unenjoyable hot mess. But yeah, there's there's no reason like unless you really want to like do what we're doing, basically. And like, you know, find the connections and, and you know, look at the series as a whole. I mean, that could be a, a fun little project. It was certainly a fun enough little project for us to talk about on the show. All these movies are under two hours, so it's really not hard to do. Yeah. And and like so in that regard, it was it was certainly not even close to the worst thing I've had to sit through on this show. Um, It had its moments. And, and I think that like. The movie kind of tricks you at the beginning. I'm sure we'll talk more about this into thinking that it's going to be cooler than it ends up being. Um, but yeah, the the movie's a, com- a complete and total mess. Uh, I, I didn't despise it, but it's definitely bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, to be fair, I, I think I as well have tempered my rage against Cloverfield Paradox. The first time I watched it, I finished and I was just kind of depressed after it. Uh, this time I'm like, okay, let's kind of dissect what went wrong with it uh and i appreciate the first half of it a lot i think that the first half of this movie is genuinely pretty good there's some great body horror to it there's some great physical comedy to it uh it's 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 a solid first half of a movie and then the back half comes along and you go oh Oh, never mind. This is a bad movie. Uh, And as Jackson said, it's not necessarily even a bad movie in that it's boring or particularly uninteresting. It just gets really muddled and kind of lost in itself. It's it's stupid. It's a stupid movie. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, it was a stupid movie in the first half, but it was a stupid movie masquerading behind good ideas that those good ideas fall away (laughs) like like there was the potential for something not stupid to be going on um potential that is um slowly but surely squandered until you hit a point where you're like what the fuck have i been watching again (laughs) (laughs) i was watching these so i watched these movies with sam uh and when we went through watched all three of them again because sam had never seen paradox she had only seen the first cloverfield on like a 10 inch laptop screen while we were in the middle of nowhere uh so we rewatched them again just kind of had a great time with it uh and i remember after we finished 10 cloverfield lane she was just asking like a bunch of questions like so how does this factor in here how does this work to the, the rest of the world and, like my big thesis with cloverfield as a whole is that these movies work best when they take place around the concept of cloverfield around the concept of the monster movies the invasions everything else going on in cloverfield uh when they're small little personal stories And that's what Cloverfield and 10 Cloverfield Lane are. They're both very small personal stories that just kind of happen to take place during, uh oh, bad things are happening. And they never really explain what those bad things are. And that is definitely to the movie's benefit because it doesn't get bogged down and like, oh, we have to explain what the Cloverfield monster was and how it got here and everything like that, which is just a bunch of lore that doesn't add to the movie or to anything else going on. So Sam was like, what are all these things? And I'm just like, Sam, I cannot answer this. I cannot answer this. I cannot answer this. <laughs> and then we get to Cloverfield Paradox, where it ostensibly seems like it's trying to answer some of these questions that Sam was asking. And we ended and Sam's like, I think I have more and worse questions <laughs> following Paradox. <laughs> No, I mean, it's really interesting because, like, like that's, that's completely true. And I think, like, comparing it to Godzilla last week, right, like, particularly the first one, is, like, that's sort of the hook, is that in Godzilla, or at least the first one, like, there's a bit 
of uh, of some focus on like on the ground tragedy and like the loss of human life but like generally the plot's pretty high level like you're talking about like you know the scientists and the politicians and like the generals who are trying to figure out how to like manage the crisis they know what godzilla is they know where he came from um so like you know that's you know that's all part and parcel of like the kaiju movie whereas cloverfield really really commits to the bit of you know you are just another like you know tiny tiny person on the ground like in the uh in the face of a unimaginable disaster that uh, here here's a party of people get to know them and watch them die yeah yeah it's it, it's simple and it's straightforward in that way and i think that um to the movie's credit i think one of the most interesting things about it is like if we're comparing it to godzilla much how godzilla was a a nuclear war movie um i think that you could definitely argue that Cloverfield is a 9-11 movie. So in that sense, they're both uh, using the, you know, the form of the giant monster to uh, like connect it to the broader culture it's a part of. I don't think that Cloverfield's as thorough as Godzilla in that regard, but I think it manages to capture that particular like shared terror really well of just like chaos and, and, and fear and, you know, horror and and not knowing what's happening. Like, I I think that uh, they they really stick to that bit and it really works. Well, I I think that like what makes the Cloverfield movies as an anthology work so well is that each one, they've come out so spread out from one another. Like the between the first one and the second one was eight years. The second and the third was only two years. But each one touches on a either recent fear or a current fear of just the general populace in a way that's very interesting. Like it is a series of movies that kind of feels like it's trying to have its finger on the pulse of everything going on. And like each one touches on something very distinct. The first one is very clearly a nine 11 movie in a lot of ways. The second one is very clearly uh, about the, the, the cult of QAnon kind of before QAnon was a thing. Uh, and then the, the last movie is a lot about like the energy crisis and us draining our earth and like how that's you know a big constant concern right now it's a very interesting series of films that are very clearly designed to be like this is a thing that we're worried about now this is the thing that we're worried about now and it's not like every movie is about something different and doesn't feel like it's just we're gonna make another cloverfield movie because we can which no shade at godzilla but i mean like they eventually did just start making godzilla movies because people liked godzilla movies and they would go to watch godzilla punch uh stegosaurus in the face (laughs) yeah i mean like we We stand a king. We stand Godzilla. But, like, by the time that he's, like, using his tail to do that stupid fucking drop kick against that bug boss. Uh, you, you you know the shot. Everyone's seen that gif. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the time we get to that point, like, you know, the horrors of nuclear war and, like, Godzilla as, like, a genuine horror movie monster has, has, long, uh, has long since passed. Whereas I will say... To the credit of all of these movies, they do keep that spirit of horror. And I think that, you know, you're right. Like keeping it's part of that is because as an anthology, it is concerned with like keeping its finger on like, you know, the shared like zeitgeist of anxiety, which I think is a a smart move. But I also think that um, part of the downfall of definitely paradox, but to a lesser extent, my problems with 10 Cloverfield Lane as well is where um, we go from, you know, incorporating, you know, just themes or motifs or ideas and and starting to connect things a little bit more literally. And that's that's paradox is already a, a nonsense movie like it already is basically just stuff keeps happening the movie. And then like it, it, it tries to like weld things together and like have a bunch of like callbacks and stuff. And it, and it just, it just doesn't work. Um, and then the end, the ending of Ted Cloverfield lanes, a different matter, but, um, it's, it's relatively controversial and I obviously have feelings about it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get into the, the spoilers of all that in a hot second here, but I do think it's, it's worth mentioning what Cloverfield Paradox and 10 Cloverfield Lane are beyond Cloverfield movies. Because if you're unfamiliar, both of these movies are reported to have been different movies that got tacked into the Cloverfield universe. Uh, And I think it 
works to the benefit of 10 Cloverfield Lane up to a point, which, as I said, we're definitely going to talk about. Uh, and it only hurts uh, the Cloverfield paradox in about every way, shape and <laughs> yeah. form. So it is worth noting that like when you go to watch these movies, that the only movie that was officially ever a Cloverfield movie was Cloverfield. And then the others kind of became Cloverfield movies after Abrams was like, I like that idea. Let's put that part of this. So keep that in mind as you're watching it. And th- this is kind of hearsay. I'm not sure exactly where I read this, but I- apparently like, Abrams was more interested in like producing a more traditional like giant monster movie sequel, but like just never got around to doing it or like because of the, you know, Godzilla reboot and Pacific Rim. That's what I heard is that like after seeing the Godzilla reboot and Pacific Rim, he kind of went, well, never mind. Like other other people are kind of treading this ground already. Um so it, it, it's strange in that regard that what originally was kind of a standalone movie that could have maybe become a series didn't become a series, then retroactively became a series because other movies got rolled into it, which is definitely not a bad thing. Like, I think that, like, you know, the sad truth is, like, you know, if 10 Cloverfield Lane was the seller, a lot less people would have seen it. And that would have been a shame because it was a damn great movie. So in that sense, like, you know, I'm certainly glad it got rolled into. But uh, you know, we we can talk about some of the ramifications of, of that decision on the film itself. Also, to be fair, I do think that a follow-up to Cloverfield, had they gone a traditional sequel route, would have been a mistake no matter what it was. Because I think a lot of the mystery of that movie is what makes that movie great. And whatever a sequel would have been would have sought to explore that. And I do not care. And I think that the reason that the Cloverfield movies work as anthologies is that it doesn't concern itself with the lore until it does. And then it's bad. No, no, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I can't really foresee a universe where like Cloverfield two was made and it was somehow more interesting than like what we got with this anthology approach. So, yeah, no, I completely agree. So we should uh, get into spoilers because we're going to talk about these movies at least a bit each. Uh, so let's let's do that. Before we do, as always, if you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. Tell your friends. Support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash B-A-D-H cast. Follow us on Twitter at B-A-D-H underscore cast. And you know what? This is a good time to uh, mention that there is one other element to Cloverfield that ties in really weirdly well with the podcast. Yeah, so uh, part of the beginning premise of Cloverfield, the uh, you know the the found footage angle is that they're recording a party, a going away party for the uh, the main character basically because he is a uh, he is moving to Japan and disaster strikes. Uh, I too am moving in Japan in the middle of a disaster, but you know like uh, who's who's keeping track? Um, very very soon within uh, the the next month. So, um, that's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, this is kind of our, our first announcement. We're going to have a little bit more of a, a formal announcement coming up here in a bit, but the podcast will be going on hiatus here at some point. But before we do, there are a couple things that we need to take care of. And one of those things. Oh, I, I, I almost don't want to say it. I almost want to like leave people in suspense. <laughs> if you know, you know. There's a there's one particular movie um, that has been coming up a lot on this on this podcast as a shared reference point that we need to get to. And no, Metal Gear Solid isn't a movie. It's not Metal Gear related. <laughs> Come back next week. It's gonna be a spicy one. No matter what, it's going to be a thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to and dreading this in equal measure. For now, though, we should talk about the movies. And we're going to do this uh, in the exact way that they were released. So let's start and talk about Cloverfield for a minute because it's going to take us a minute. There's, there's not a whole lot to say about the first Cloverfield. As we said, it's a fine movie. It's pretty damn good, honestly. Not a lot of thematic relevance to anything. It's about, you know, love and powering through and people, but also it's just kind of about watching people die to a big monster and shaky cam and cool filmmaking and 9-11. 
Yeah, I mean, insofar as I have anything to say about the first one beyond, like, this is a solid, well-made monster movie, it is because of the, uh, like, 9-11 connections. And I'm sure that, like, if you were so inclined, like, you could have a lot to say about, like, the ARG and, like, the hype surrounding it and, like, you know, what if, what if anything, sort of the legacy of the movie and its marketing style was. But, you know, I, I don't know much about any of that, so you will know, have to defer to other people um even but even with like the it's not even so much a 9-11 metaphor as like i mean it kind of is but it's it's not as like explicit as something like godzilla it, it feels like it's more trying to just like capture the feeling of being on the ground in a disaster and like you know that was the cultural touchstone for disasters at the time um but there are a lot of elements you can see come through where like they clearly took inspiration oh my god the the, the dust blast throughs the the i mean the the statue of liberty decapitation is a huge like red flag right there of, oh look we're watching a, a symbol of americana fall yeah, I mean it's it's it it is a movie that as Jackson said, it's not like through and through this is a 9/11 movie and you can watch it without really picking up on the the kind of allegorical references to 9/11, but like as soon as you do, you're like, okay, no, I this is definitely as Jackson said a movie about being on the ground floor when 9/11 happens and seeing it happen in your city and watching the devastation and the horror that comes with that and how it feels to be a little person throughout that whole experience. But it's also very easy to not notice that because it is just kind of a big monster movie and doesn't really delve deep into you know, terrorism, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not a 9-11 movie in the same way that, like, The Dark Knight is, right? Where, like, The Dark Knight very clearly, like, has the, uh, like, Bush administration policies and, like, you know, the threat of terrorism. Like, that's that's all very much, like, explicitly baked into the text. Like, this is more, like, trying to capture a feeling, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and and I think it does that. I think it does that well. Like, you know, I wasn't there <laughs> during during 9-11, obviously. But I but from all the uh, the thing I kept noticing was the the emphasis on the phones in the movie. Like, that's always a big part of, um, you know, people who are slightly older than us. Like, we remember when 9-11 happened. We were but we were really young. So I, I think it's fair to say, like, I, I don't know about you, but like, I don't remember much of like a pre 9-11 world or like it, like you know had anything like earth shattering to my young psyche like that you know i can only speak for myself but the only thing i remember really pre 9-11 is when i fell in the toilet as a child and that's <laughs> not super relevant <laughs> i remember being scared of the toilet because i thought i'd get space jammed into it <laughs> We were too young to remember a pre-9-11 time is what this boils down to. Yeah. So. For people who are slightly older from the, uh, like, the story is, like, when people talk about their 9-11 their experience, like, there's always a big focus on the phones. Like, who did you call? Like, it, it, you know, particularly from people who are New Yorkers, like, who did you call? Like, who could you get a hold of? Who were you scared that, that like, you couldn't get a hold of? And, like, that's something that shows up in this movie a lot. Like, that's basically the main plot. But but even more, even more so, like, I think the scene that I really like is when the main character calls his mom to tell him that his yeah. brother's dead. Yeah, to tell him that his brother's dead. Because at first, it's like, he doesn't even react. He's too focused on, like, his, you know, his not-girlfriend. But, like, then once they're, they have a moment and, like, it all just, like, sinks in, he just, like, completely breaks. That That's really well. Well done. And, and that's pretty much what we have to say about the first Cloverfield movie. I, I want to, I guess, set some scenes for what's to come just on broader Cloverfield canon, I suppose, is the way to put it. Uh, because the Cloverfield is the movie that introduces the monster, uh, the, the big kaiju that goes by the name Cloverfield. Um, and it really kind of. It just it introduces it as a as a devastating thing that wrecks a, a whole city and cannot be taken down by the army. Like that is really the only thing it introduces to the canon of Cloverfield. But that's all it needs to introduce for 10 Cloverfield to hit just a little bit different. 
because 10 Cloverfield starts before that event takes place. Not long before, but like a little bit beforehand. Uh, as our main character, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, is leaving her fiance and driving down the road before she gets taken off the road by John Goodman and brought into a bunker where John Goodman tells her that everything is fucked, that like there's some attack up above, the air is toxic, and it's all bad. Which... This is where it kind of boils down to, I, I'm going to let Jackson talk thematically here, and we're kind of inverting, I suppose, from how we opened up with Cloverfield, <laughs> uh, in that I want to talk a little bit about the setup, and then we'll let Jackson talk about themes. So, this movie, as I said, would stand on its own very easily, because like John Goodman's character is believable enough to be lying to uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as about what's going on above, no matter what. Uh, and so, it's, it's a really interesting vibe there, but knowing that Cloverfield takes place and that this is a movie in the Cloverfield canon really adds a little bit of extra unreliability to our basically unreliable narrator of John Goodman, who is out here saying that, oh, yes, it is bad up there. Don't worry about it. But you're looking up above and seeing that it looks fine. So is it really bad? But this is a Cloverfield movie, right? So what's going on up there? And wait, the Cloverfield aliens didn't do any toxic gas stuff. Like there was no toxic stuff up there what's he talking about is this actually part of that and so having this cloverfield canon of just knowing that it takes place in the same universe where the cloverfield monster attacked is deeply interesting and adds to a layer of the unreliability of an already very good and unreliable character that is john goodman yeah, I, compl I completely agree. Like, this movie is full of great fucking tension. Like, a lot of great, like, physical, like, action-related tension. Like, oh, God, that scene. Uh, like, you know that a movie's tense when you still, like, clench up even after you've seen the movie and you know everything that happens. And that fucking scene with the barrel, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. this movie left more of an impact on me than I thought it did because I, I only just now realized that, like, putting someone in the barrel is is something that like i say <laughs> like <laughs> like to imply like a bad fate you know <laughs> um so i mean that's that, it was also a plot point in breaking bad but like i, I you know it, it th these things reinforce each other um but yeah like no that scene of john goodman like you're gonna tell me what's going on or you're going in the barrel and it's like oh my god yeah, that, this movie, the, the claustrophobia in this movie is just mwah, absolutely incredible, uh, both when it is a large claustrophobia of being stuck in this underground bunker, but also when it's a claustrophobia of crawling through the vents, which is horrible. <sighs> Especially when they do it the second time when, like, you know, John Goodman's gone full Hulk mode and is, like, trying to stab her through the vent. Oh, my fucking God. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, Sam has seen this movie before and spent the entire time jumping. Like, oh, oh, God. Oh, God. And I'm like, wow, this is still hitting you really hard, huh? And she's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. And it, for good reason. It's a it's a terrifying fucking movie. It's a great thriller. Like, everything is staged really well. Um, What, what I think elevates it from just a just a great thriller to like a genuinely really amazing movie like i like i think that this is uh like my my esteem for this movie has only grown i think especially watching the two movies back to back because i guess like what you know th this movie has a bit more on its mind in terms of explicit themes whereas like the original cloverfield is kind of trying to capture a feeling this movie feels more like it's got something to say. And what I think is really cool about, you know, this anthology aspect is that even though this wasn't made originally as a sequel to Cloverfield, like, it feels like the movie is about sort of the aftermath of 9-11, kind of the world that emerged afterward and, like, paranoia and conservatism and, like, this weird sort of paternalism because that's what makes John Goodman's character such an effective villain not just his performance which is fucking stand out like it's it's incredible to see john goodman who normally you see him and you're like oh i love that fucking goober like i love john goodman who doesn't love john goodman right um and to see him like as this like 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 with uncut gems like i look at him and i don't see john goodman i just see someone that i am afraid of <laughs> God, that's what's so great about his character is that i think this movie is a really great example of like how to make your villain feel human without 
like going so far as to condone their actions and turn them into a hero or like make them necessarily someone you're supposed to like or or make like apologies for and that john goodman's character feels very human i mean i live in bumfuck nowhere i i've met guys like this and that's the scariest part (laughs) um like he does like have human emotions like he does have his own twisted way of seeing the world um it's just that that way is really damaging and abusive and controlling and that's what makes him into like such a monster uh not that he's like completely void of feelings but that his feelings are so twisted that you know he comes to impose those those feelings in a dangerous like maddening way and that particularly dangerous maddening way is i mean it is conservatism like a very particular brand of conservatism that very paternalistic um like you know oh like i'm the i'm the man of the house like a man provides for his family and like a man keeps his family safe and so i think nowhere better identified than in the charade scene Oh God, yeah. He he can't he can't call Mary Elizabeth Winstead a woman. He just can't fucking do it. <laughs> nope. It's it, the the card is little women and the the other dude, the the chuck the, the poor, poor chuckle fuck that they're with is just like little and then points at Mary Elizabeth Winstead and John Goodman's just like girl, daughter, sweetie, princess, little princess, and like you just sit there and it, it's it makes you sit in that scene for like 30 seconds of John Goodman just like naming things that are so infantilizing and getting more and more frustrated and then only blaming poor Chucklefuck for the mistake is just oh yeah and that's that's some scary shit and that's some real shit too like that's like like how many times have you heard like the joke of like you know someone you know a guy who's starting to date like a girl and it's like oh what are you gonna meet your dad like you know don't piss him off i'm sure he's got guns like this is very culturally ingrained this idea that like you know a father is someone um who who who, like you know protects the his his daughter from the world and all the horrible like things out to get her like only his daughter is his property it's an age-old like you know misogynistic idea a uh, patriarchal idea and that's the fear that this movie really really deals in and what makes it even stronger like you know taking this sort of like post 9 11 view into account is that it's not directly related but it ties back into that those same sorts of fears of like overreacting to a perceived or real threat like you know doubling down on the things that you're afraid of and like you know losing everything and hurting everyone in the process like you know the way that uh we as a country reacted to (laughs) 9-11 frankly these movies do a wonderful job as i've mentioned earlier of really personifying the the moment the the fears the anxieties of the time and this is a really good example of that uh, but I also know that Jackson has some problems with the ending that I share, albeit for slightly different reasons. Yeah, so I've got basically two problems with the ending. One's one's a little more direct. Uh, we'll, we'll focus on the more pressing one to what I've been saying for now, which is all that stuff that I said about, um you know the the movies like breakdown of like patriarchal like you know reactionary doomsday prepping conservatism i think that all holds pretty true i think that's all pretty pretty clear from the text uh shame that in the last 15 minutes it turns out that john goodman's character was completely right about everything um that uh that maybe that maybe complicates things to say the least it it really does and i i'll let you kind of explain that in a second but i I think this goes back and it's important to note what i said earlier which is to say this wasn't a cloverfield movie originally so this ending feels very tacked on like oh fuck we need to make a cloverfield ending to it because what happens is she escapes from the bunker blows it up kills john goodman with it and then gets attacked by aliens this culminates in her blowing up 
a giant alien spaceship with a Molotov cocktail. Uh, which is a far cry from the very subdued, tense, personal story that had been going on beforehand. I described this to Jackson like if at the end of the first Alien movie, they put the end of the Aliens movie where Ripley fights the alien queen in a giant mech suit. It's just incredibly discordant with everything else that had happened beforehand. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute because I think that'll also segue very nicely into the Cloverfield Paradox. (laughs) But you should talk about why this doesn't work on a thematic level. Yeah, sure. And and like I, I completely agree with with Sean's assessment of like, you know, the the tone and stuff that's going on. That that might be honestly like my bigger problem with it is that like a, a, as far as pacing goes, like defeating John Goodman kind of feels like the central tension and like so we kind of just keep going on with a little bit more action. That action so much more over the top. Like, you know, the tossing a Molotov cocktail into the aliens like Death Star hole. Like, come on now. Um, but uh beyond that i think that my thematic concerns to be to be clear and to be fair it's not like this this is the kind of ending that completely undoes the movie like i kind of see what they're going for and it's still relevant to the like prepper metaphor and stuff because if you think about like you know as i alluded to earlier like what what was so wrong about like america's response to 9-11 it's not that people were scared it's understandable that people were scared what was wrong was that like in response our country to like you know dive like straight into xenophobia and started curtailing civil liberties and doing all that shit um and so i think that you know there's something to that like you can still have John Goodman be correct that the aliens are out there, that something really bad is happening. Um, and, but maybe like, maybe it's something about the way that it's presented that like, you know, with, with this escalation of action so far, um, it, it, it feels like we're giving John Goodman's character a lot more credence. Whereas I feel like the point should overall be more like, yes, things are, are, you know, things that are bad do happen. Like 9-11 did happen and it was scary and terrifying. But that doesn't mean that we need to, like, sacrifice everything to have this insane conservative prepper mindset. And I, I think the movie still gets there, albeit with a lot less grace. Um, I, I think it, for me, it would have been a lot more effective. Like, you know, you still you could still have the monsters, you know, to tie it back into the Cloverfield stuff more. But like um, you mentioned in the pre-discussion, just like having her fight the smaller one or like I, I even think, you know, because the main tension is John Goodman. It would have even been better if she just like you know saw the the ship like flying off in the distance to like a city and then she decides to chase it because you need that character beat of like taking responsibility for um you know making things better uh you know i i I think that would have worked a lot better than like you know floating death star battle (laughs) And, and to be clear what this boils down to is i don't think that having the alien battle at the end well I I think that having the alien battle at the end is the problem. I don't think having the aliens are necessarily a problem because it does finish the character story that has started beforehand of her always running away from her problems. But this time being like, nah, fuck that. I took out this asshole. Let's go take out some goddamn aliens. Fuck yeah. Uh, But instead, we do get like that. Fuck yeah. Let's go take out some goddamn aliens. That feels like it should be out of an entirely different movie uh, and just undermines kind of some of the the subtle nuance that took place in this one. Yep. Totally agreed. Want to start shooting up paradox? (laughs) I do, because that's actually that that, subtle nuance was what made me upset about the ending of 10 Cloverfield Lane. And continued right on into paradox now, didn't it? And anything that I could say that I take issue with at the at the end of, of 10 Cloverfield Lane. And like, yeah, like I probably do think it's a better movie if you like hit hit the stop button and like, you know, eject the DVD as it were, like after after she blows up John Goodman's bunker. But like anything, any problems I have with that are like tenfold in the next one. <laughs> So before we start shitting on Cloverfield Paradox, I do want to give it some credit where credit is due. As I said, the first half of that movie, 
It's pretty all right, honestly. It starts off strong with some really good body horror, with some really good kind of goofy performances. Chris O'Dowd there is a, a comedic actor from the IT crowd, absolutely fantastic, delivers some really fucking funny lines. I really like Chris O'Dowd in this movie. Yeah, he, he's charming. He's entertaining. Like like that, and 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 the like sci-fi, like it. There's definitely enough there that's like unique that make you feel like that it's going somewhere, you know, that like it's going to add up to something. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it presents all these ideas as really interesting things that are like, ooh, this is going to pay off in some capacity, like when Chris O'Dowd loses his arm and the arm comes back crawling and moving on its own, like out of Evil Dead. That feels like it's going to be something, like they're going to explain how it's happening and like it's because the the two are interact, the, the two paradoxes are interacting at the same time. The, the rundown of Cloverfield Paradox, because we didn't actually explain what the fuck it is, uh, is basically like the whole fear about the Higgs boson collider it was real and in fact led to uh, a, a paradox in which two universes basically intersected and swapped. And so you had this ship, the the fucking Cloverfield, of course it was called the Cloverfield. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I actually just want to say... Um, the, the sign the, at the end of 10. Yes, that, that was the actual worst part of the movie. It's like, okay, we did not need that. <laughs> Sam raised a really interesting point um, that this might go into the ARG a little bit. This might be part of why it's called Cloverfield and that John Goodman character was involved in like the Navy and stuff and launching satellites and ideas and stuff like that. So he might have at some point, like if the alien arrived on a meteor or something like that, they might've called it the Cloverfield meteor because John Goodman saw it way back when and like put his street name on it. So like theoretically there's kind of an interesting like parallel there through the ARGs seeing it in the movie, not knowing the ARGs it's fucking stupid. <laughs> That's a fair point. I, I I I cede to that point that she's making. Um, but that but yeah. Also, that didn't stop me from letting out the biggest fucking grow. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it it's bad. Uh, it definitely feels like something that is there specifically for people who are like really into the args and like really into like the deep lore of Cloverfield. Uh, but outside of that, it basically is just like title troll. Uh, which is stupid. It didn't need that. Yeah, like, I don't even know if I necessarily mind that he lives on, like, 10 Cloverfield Lane, but, like, it was, th the execution was so, like, you know, it wasn't just there in a shot. It was, like, you know, you know, sign gets Front knocked over. and center. Yup, <laughs> yup. <laughs> Yeah, so the ship is is not as clearly called the Cloverfield. It's They call it the Shepherd for the most part. Wait, why the fuck does it have Cloverfield on the ship? It's it's the um I I I I kept getting this confused but I think that I think the Cloverfield is the ship and the Shepherd is the name of the particle accelerator. Oh, okay, that makes sense. They don't really ever call the ship the Cloverfield or anything like that. No, they they, they say it like once. <laughs> yes. So there is references to it being the Cloverfield. That makes more sense though. Uh still stupid. Very stupid. Uh yes. like <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> Especially because this is a movie that is, is very much obsessed with trying to kind of connect everything that's been going on in the back. Okay, so a, a fair word of warning before we really start diving into this. This movie is a mess. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a bad movie by itself made worse by the fact that they shoehorned a bunch of Cloverfield nonsense into it. As I said, the first half is good, but it was clearly going to fall apart in the back half, whether it was involved in the Cloverfield canon or not. So as we talk about it, it's really hard to necessarily pinpoint what makes it a bad movie and what makes it a bad Cloverfield movie, because there's so much overlap between the two that it kind of muddles the water and just becomes this gross mess of a weird, bad movie. Yeah, I, I think what makes it a bad movie at its core, I think, you know, when we say that it would have been bad regardless of if they stapled the Cloverfield stuff to it, I think the ultimate problem is just like they had... They had this idea to make a, a particle accelerator horror movie. Interesting, unique. Where are we going to go with this? Well, that's a that's some really complicated stuff, and it would have been tricky as it was to like 
fully make good on that movie and like and like as it is here's the thing all right hang on i'm gonna cut you off right here okay sure because i don't think it necessarily would have been that hard to make that right like honest to god if it was just like a particle accelerator oh no we swapped and we're merging and like you know we're 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 mixing together and falling apart and stuff like that i swear to god i've seen this in kids shows and like the solution is to just undo it and like you know parallel dimensions come and go like that's that is a huge trope of science fiction stuff i've seen this time and time again and they can do it really really well and really really interestingly and so like just like a quick like oh we just have to fire it again and we'll we'll d- disassemble and like we'll figure out what happens on the other side there. that's not hard to do and as long as like the core element of horror and body horror and interesting stuff going on is interesting you've got something to it the problem the problem is the heart of the movie which is hamilton and again i don't think that hamilton by herself is necessarily a problem the problem is that like she runs into this weird moral dilemma that isn't really like it's set up but only in the most vaguest way in that like it it is it feels like a b plot but suddenly takes over the full back half of the movie and is just dumb yeah, no, I I think you're right, because, like, what I mean when I say it's hard to make that movie work is that, like, because you're totally correct and that, like, it's not like this is completely new ground or anything. But what I think is trickier is to take that high concept stuff and, like, tie it back into, like, a human story in a way that resonates, which they did not do here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, honestly, God, it's, it's the type of thing, though, too, where, like, I don't even know that I would need a, a human story that would resonate to make this whole thing work for me. Like, I I like Cloverfield as a movie by itself, and there's a human element to it, but for the most part, I just like watching people run around and die. Like, it's a solid horror movie unto itself. I just like horror movies in places. Well, I, 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 think, I think that's fair up to a point, but I, I do think that part of the motifs we're talking about like the motifs that make a cloverfield movie a cloverfield movie like what are the elements i do think that this idea that like we're looking at the human element like kind of on the micro level and the scope of something bigger i i do think that that while while you're right and that you wouldn't necessarily need that to make a cool you know horror movie about this particle accelerator stuff i do think that for a cloverfield movie like that's one of the strongest connecting threads that it has is like that's, emotionally and thematically that's entirely fair i was not talking about it as a cloverfield movie sure, i was sure. just talking about it like if this was just a like i was talking about this if it was just the paradox like yeah no you're completely right about that so I just want I just want that on record that like I was just talking about it as the paradox, not the Cloverfield paradox, because as soon as you stop that Cloverfield in there, you open up a whole nother fucking can of worms and that they did try and do some emotional heart thing. But like it is such a, a nonsense bit of emotional heart that like I like I see what they were trying to do here, but it's so shoehorned in and feels so weird that it doesn't work especially because then you get like the the other engineer going off the rails and like it's unclear what her motivation is for the bit there and then it's like oh it was this and then it's over and then we move on and you're like okay wait this feels like an entirely different movie tacked onto the back half of this movie which already has another movie tacked onto it because we haven't talked about her husband yet no I, I, so let's i want to put a pin in the husband because while i'm still thinking about like that la- the climax of her like fighting the alternate universe engineer um the way the movie handles those reveals is completely ass backwards and the, like you know the, that she she goes on a rampage we and at this point, we still think that Hamilton is going to stay in this universe. So she goes on her on her rampage and doesn't reveal her motivation for doing so until later. Then Hamilton tries to stop her for for seemingly no reason <laughs> because because she was planning on staying in the universe anyway, only to find out after she's already stopped her that she's made the decision to like you know let this universe be this universe so like it's not necessarily that like the logic of the characters is like completely incomprehensible but the way they dole out that information makes it seem that way (laughs) yeah no i I mean entirely like uh, the i again the back half of this movie just stresses me out so fucking much because it's (laughs) such a fucking nightmare i i look i need to talk about this for a second um because 
I, I, I just need to talk about horror deaths for a moment here because this movie in the first half of the movie has some really interesting, unique horror deaths. Like I really, really like watching the Russian dude uh, Volkov die because he like pukes up a bunch of worms and stuff like that. Like that's a really interesting, neat death. And I, I, I dig it. Um, it does introduce the problem of like, why was he talking to himself? Like what was his whole plan there? And like, I think the idea was like, he was merging with himself, but that doesn't get explored enough. But like, honest to God, that's fine. We can blow past that. Like, there's enough interesting stuff happening around it that we can just move past it. Don't worry about the weird eyeball thing going on. Just watch him puke up a bunch of worms and die. It's, it's interesting. It, it, it's, a, it's a good, freaky death that would that gets under your skin and makes it crawl a little bit. Uh, when you first see the, the alternate engineer, she's embedded in a wall with, like, wires going in and out of her and, like, clearly stuck in this weird, paradoxical state. And it's really uncomfortable to look at and great and wonderful. When Mundy loses his arm, Chris O'Dowd's character loses his arm he gets like sucked into a wall and it's freaky and like you look at the arm and you can see the bone and tissue underneath it but like no blood and it's just weird and unnerving and uh, uncomfortable to look at and think about so like this first half is really interesting filled with cool unique deaths and then you get the character who's drowning before the 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 engineer prime I guess we'll call her her name's Tam I know that sure. uh <laughs> Before she goes and like starts to drown in space and then the, the door opens and, you know, the, the whole thing flash freezes and as the, the vacuum of space hits the water, which is a fine death. I didn't think it was super interesting because like it kind of plays into too many things at once and that like you can't really relate to it, I think is the problem. Like you don't really know what it would be like to get flash frozen while drowning. Like I think that there's a there's a problem there, um, but, you know, it, it could have been executed well. But that's the turning point where the deaths just get stupider. Well, and, Fuck and, and I think me. I think part of it is that, like, you know, I, I think that for a while the movie is good about pacing them. Like, the, I, like, I think that I like the idea of the, like, weird, like, timey-wimey dimensional fuckery, like, slowly getting worse. But after a while, like, did it feel like to you that, like, it was... For the most of the movie, it's just a normal spaceship until conveniently it's not. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you no, know? entirely. Like, like I think that's my big problem is it doesn't feel genuinely like, you know, like a horror we can't comprehend. It's just like the plot co- proceeds as normal until she has to do the plot thing that would help them. Now well, it's time to die. Yeah, I was going to say, Tam's whole thing is that, like, she walked into this room and it was fine, and then you watch the screen flicker to be like, H2O leak, and I'm like, okay, that's fucking stupid, whatever. Yes. But that's not even the part that I'm getting at, because here's the other element to it, is that those parts at least feel like something is going on, like the ship is basically attacking them in some capacity, right? Like, even as the, the H2O thing shifts, like, it's kind of like a groaner, but, like, you still feel like something's going weird and wrong. Sure. Uh from there it just gets dumb and bad okay let's let's break this down okay so keel <laughs> lay the, on me the american scientist uh after chris o'dowd blows himself up i'm gonna talk about that in a second that is the one that drives me the most mad and i'm gonna talk about it. i'm saving it for last after he blows himself up by accident uh he has to go down keel has to go down and let loose the 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 gyroscope that's keeping that section of the ship and it's like dangerously tilting or something like that don't fucking think too hard about it. he's he's got to do an interstellar they stole this from interstellar <laughs> yeah yeah he has to go do an interstellar um yeah. and so he goes down to go do an interstellar and it's like oh i can't eject this without out the door sealed like okay <laughs> what so basically no matter what someone's going to die if they had to eject that why is the fail safe that someone has to die to eject this talk talk about a design flaw am i right gamer <laughs> so like that that is seemingly nitpicky and cinema sinzy i will grant you that but it compounds on the fact that then we see monk die after uh alternate engineer just shoots him and walks away but schmidt's fine after getting shot twice in the same spot <laughs> but monk i guess had just worn out his welcome and just fucking chuck him in the space he doesn't matter anymore and then there's monday and monday's death defies literally everything because monday's death so like a section of the ship starts to magnetize and like all right I'm okay with that. We can we can have a section of the ship magnetized. I uh, give me an explanation afterwards. I'm okay with it. But like you know that that's freaky. 
And your, your immediate assumption is, oh, God, he's going to get, like, the, this whole ship is metal. He's going to get punctured by a bunch of, like, metal things going after. Uh, but then you remember that he's been spending this entire time with, like, this magnet gun that does a bunch of, like, really super magnet shit. Uh, and you're like, oh, no. Uh, you, you start to watch the, the magnet shit that's been going on. Like, the, the ferrous fluid start to, like crawl after him in space and you're like oh god he's gonna get like punctured by it and like it's all gonna slap on the other side of the wall and just gonna like crush his ribs and everything it's gonna be gross and gory it fucking grabs him and pulls him to the opposite side of the ship for what reason it comes alive and drags him against the magnetic currents back to the other side and like forces him to eat a bunch of it before the ship explodes when an O2 canister detonates. What the fuck is happening in that scene at all? Like everything else up to this point had been based in some sort of science and made sense. But as soon as this happens, it just like says, yeah, no, fuck it. It's, it's Calvin ball here, baby. Nothing <laughs> matters. It's all wonky. Did that, did that not bother you at all? Because it drove me up a fucking wall. I, I had sort of, like, that's kind of how I felt about the about the movie going into this scene. By this point, I had kind of accepted, like, okay, this, this movie's just going to do whatever the fuck it wants. So, like, um, so you're correct. I gave up on the movie sooner than that, though. <laughs> that's fair. This, this part just bothers me because I think mostly... It was almost something cool. Like, honest to God, had the like the, the ferro fluid or whatever the fuck it was come off the piping and slammed him against the other side of the wall and just like crushed him there. And like, you know, basically you, you get crushed between a magnet that's forcing you against a wall. That's something that you can imagine. Like that's something you being crushed by a, a force that just wants to get with another force. Like that's that's good. That's interesting. I want that like that. You can imagine that you can feel that you can be grossed out by it. And then it pulls him the other way, like some sort of alien hand took over on it, and it makes no sense. So I think that's the anger I have. <laughs> Would Do you think they were planning to do something more like what you're saying with the magnets, but then had to tone it down because they wanted it to be PG-13 like the other two? Probably, honestly, if I if I had to guess. Is this movie PG-13? I'm pretty sure that it is. It's, it's not, like, especially gory. Um, and, like, that's fine. I don't necessarily need it to be super gory by itself, but, like, you can feel it in places. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, again, especially in the back half. Like, I, I think yeah. that the first half is fairly good at hiding the fact that it's PG-13. Like, Oh, I was, I was like, cringing when a... Uh, Russian guy had like the the eye shit uh, fuck eyes why do mm -hmm. we have those yeah. terrible organs of uh, the worms yeah no I mean that's that's why like I wasn't really thinking about it until that point actually it wasn't until like the flash freezing like I feel like 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 remember in alien resurrection when like the the fucking newborn gets like you know red misted and like sucked out into the vacuum of space like there were a couple parts where I was expecting that to happen I'm like oh wait a minute <laughs> Yeah, you're right, by the way. It is PG-13. I looked it up. Uh, but yeah, I know that does kind of retroactively explain some of my criticism with it. Um, but like, I, I even then, like, I you you could still do it. Like, they had to dissect that one guy. They had to dissect the, the Russian Volkov. Yeah. So like, you don't have to get it bloody, but like, even just crushing it. You could do like a fucking Looney Tunes print where you could see the body, and then like, you just watch the body shape disappear as like, it basically gets pulverized into nothingness and one with the, the wall and the the ferro fluid or whatever like that's a thing you could do that and it would be good and interesting and also not bloody well we got we gotta blow it up we gotta blow it up so we can have the other guy die <laughs> in the stupidest possible way oh uh, and then of course there's the other guy on earth who is just <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> Hamilton's husband is back on Earth, just basically going through the plot of Cloverfield 1 and 10 Cloverfield Lane, but like the abridged, uninteresting versions of them. <laughs> My man's there to make the movie 15 minutes longer. <laughs> Genuinely, it doesn't even need to be. It's an hour 42. <laughs> you could have cut it at a clean hour and a half. Why? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's so it's it's so boring. It's so nothing. It's there to add like that that human element, that heart element to it that we've been talking about, oh, at least in part. He, he's taking care of the girl and they got trauma about their kids. It's like poetry, it rhymes. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's absolutely nothing and not relevant to anything else going on. Like that would be like if in Ten Cloverfield Lane, it would occasionally cut to her boyfriend. Yeah, and just be like him, just like, wow, what's going on over here? I'm gonna go fight some space aliens. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, that was my Bradley Cooper impression. I hope you all enjoyed it because the boyfriend <laughs> in 10 Cloverfield is Bradley Cooper. <laughs> you never really see his face, but you hear his voice. Amazing. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's utter nonsense and like just really flies in the face of what made the other two movies so interesting in that like they were very tight personal stories with like three six people and then this one's like we're gonna do that again but also we did have this other dude off doing fuck knows what literally nothing to do with anything going on in the plot uh and then we also need to like ham fist try and explain like the timeline of the movies in some capacity or something i i don't really know what they were trying to answer with the cloverfield paradox but it felt like they were trying to answer something it, it it's it's like how metal gear solid 5 spent a billion dollars making a video game to explain a question that nobody asked which was how a man from an 8-bit game survived getting shot by a rocket launcher and in this case it's Wait, what? I, I think the I think the question they were trying to answer was literally, wait, what? Because <laughs> I don't I don't know what else it would have been. And even then, it doesn't answer any questions with any sort of anything, honestly. I mean, that's true. It's sub MGS5 level because at least how however fucking stupid the question, at least MGS5 was answering a question. <laughs> It was a question that nobody had, but it was a question. <laughs> okay, hang on. Let, let's, let's break this down for a second. Okay, like, I, I actually want to see if we can figure this out. All right, all right. Let's do it. Cloverfield 1 introduced the monster, and, like, it didn't really ra- it, it raised a bunch of questions, but, like, kind of hand waved them away as, like, you don't need to know about this. Like, this doesn't matter. Just watch these people in, in, in this horror movie. You know, watch it happen. Is it an alien? Is it a sea beast? Is it a Lovecraft? Who knows? Who cares? Exactly. 10 Cloverfield uh, kind of answered some of those questions by being like, okay, they're aliens. They, they've come, and, like, John Goodman kind of explained that, like, the, the, the Cloverfield monster was the frontline attack to wipe out population centers and now everything else is coming along to to do everything else that's all right all right okay this actually now that you're saying john goodman had the specific explanation i think that's what nettles me so much is not that john goodman was right that there were aliens i think that's fine it's that he was exactly correct in how they operate too like you know the mothership comes by and is like gassing her and like hunting down like he was 100 percent correct and that nettles me a little bit <laughs> That's fair. Sorry, sorry. I just had that. I just had that realization about what was eating at me about that. Continue. No, you're good. I, I think in it, 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 we're going to talk about this for a second here because I think in the movie's defense, I think that's a, just a, a fairly common militaristic tactic. So him being right about that was just him like understanding basic Sun Tzu art of war shit. It's it's not that it's it's not that it's illogical or like unreasonable that he could ascertain that, but I think that. Uh, again it's more about like the feeling that the movie provides that we're going to overcome this like overbearing um controlling abusive asshole and then like sort of implicitly like emotionally like seeing things play out like exactly as he foretold uh kind of gives emotionally to me like the implicit feeling of like oh he he was on to something but that i feel like the point of the movie should not be that john goodman was on to something <laughs> that's fair oh, that's totally fair um but this does lead us to the question of what did the cloverfield paradox provide like what what <laughs> what did it add to the world in any way, shape, or form? And like, okay, let's even let's take it a step even further back. Before we ask about like what did it add to the Cloverfield mythos, what did the movie add thematically or artistically? Because Cloverfield One adds like just a, a really good feeling of what it's like to be on the ground in in a horrible disaster. It's a really effective horror movie in that regard. Ten Cloverfield is just a really good movie about, you know, being abducted and gaslit and all that good shit. And also all of Jackson's themes and like the anxieties around fucking doomsday preppers and shit. And the beautiful thing about those things, they all tie together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're thematically coherent to each other. What did the Cloverfield Paradox do in any way, shape or form? It 
knew that the Large Hadron Collider was a scary thing that people talked about. <laughs> yes. Um, it parallel universes and grief and existentialism that's like the closest the closest thing is that like realization that like oh you know we we aren't even if that person's the same me it's not me it's a different me you know as soon as there's a differentiation our experiences we're not the same person i and that's just like existentialism 101 so like good work you're I guess. also giving it way 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 too much credit because like the thing is that the other two movies kind of presented those themes and ideas in a very nuanced way that you didn't actually feel like you were learning those themes. No, this movie yes. basically <laughs> turns to the camera and says, we are the same person, but we aren't the same person. Do you get it? Yeah. Um. And so to the answer, no, I don't get it. Because when you look <laughs> at me and tell me your themes, I, they bounce off a lot easier. Show don't tell, baby. Yeah, no, that, that's me being ultra charitable. But, like, otherwise the movie feels just like a mess of, like, wouldn't it be cool if? Wouldn't it be cool if all this weird shit happened? And, like, what's the mechanics underlying it? What's the story? What's the, like, themes underlying it? Don't worry about that. Have the have the big Cloverfield monster at the end. <laughs> and look, okay, I'm gonna just pat myself on the back here for a second, okay? Because Jackson Jackson's part of a D and D campaign I am running that has a lot to do with like parallel universes and paradoxes and time stuff going on I, here. I, I was thinking about the arm a lot, given that one encounter we had. <laughs> I think I put more time and thought into how this stuff executes I, in this stupid fucking <laughs> D&D campaign that I am running for four close friends of mine that is literally just like a goofy let's have a good time campaign. As someone not inside your brain, I can confirm looking from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so did it add anything to the Cloverfield mythos, though, is the question. Because, like, it. so this is going to be a weird thing that I'm going to say. Because, like, everything else feels like they took place around the Cloverfield movies, but, like, this feels like it it was both about the Cloverfield movies, but also just kind of took place at the same time, right? Yeah, like, oh, this, this dimensional fuckery, like, made monsters happen. Like, great, who cares? <laughs> but also, not really necessarily is the thing. Because, like, there's never a clear connection between the two of them. It's never clearly drawn. No, um, uh, uh, like, uh, <laughs> like, I think that might be honest to God. My biggest problem is that like this movie feels like it's kind of like nodding to like, oh, this is definitely what happened here. Right. But like, you never, you never even gave us enough of a reason to really believe that there's one moment where somebody's like, you know, if they do this, it might open the door for demons and monsters and shit. And like, I guess maybe, but. It seems to be that the only thing that happened when they did this whole thing was applied to the ship and nothing happened on Earth. So why would we assume that that's in any way related? Well, well, I mean, because they that's my problem. Wait, that's my problem. OK, my problem is that every other movie was made better by the existence of these Cloverfield monsters. And like the, it added in some capacity to like the mythos, like the, the first movie was definitely about that. 10 Cloverfield was added to because they existed. Cloverfield paradox has literally nothing to do with what's going on in Cloverfield. Nothing at fucking all. It's, it's like they want, it's like they wanted to make the explanation movie realize that that would be a terrible idea and did it anyway, but like half-assed it so they could still claim to be being ambiguous. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's honestly, or I think like a really good explanation as to why it doesn't work because you're right. Like I, I keep coming back to like, it feels like this is supposed to be an explanation movie, but it's not. And like, I, I can't, I couldn't shake why, but you're right. Like it feels like they started to went, Oh shit. Wait, no backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. <laughs> why would we do such a thing? <laughs> And didn't. And so, like, it feels like it's almost, but it's not. And so, like, everything else happening is, is just down below happening. And this movie is not enhanced by being part of the Cloverfield canon, whereas 10 Cloverfield was enhanced by being part of it. And I, again, if the, the, the part that makes 10 Cloverfield 
worse is the fact that they come out and fight aliens. Yes, absolutely, but it stands alone, and it's still a good movie. This is a bad movie. movie. Yeah, it's still a great movie. This is a bad movie. The Cloverfield part doesn't matter at all and just makes me mad as someone who likes the Cloverfield canon. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts about this movie. This is why I wanted to talk about this movie. And this is why I recommend <laughs> that we watch all three of them because the other two very much inform why this movie sucks. Yeah, yeah. Like, like this was a bad movie, but it definitely... Um I was a little more offended coming so hot off of Ted Cloverfield Lane. Like the the the, the difference in quality is pretty shocking. <laughs> um, you know, as someone not as invested, like it, it like it was more like I walked away from Cloverfield Paradox being like, well, that was trash, and then kind of moved, it kind of moved on with my day. But when you're invested, like, and, and you see all this dumb fuck lore stuff, I mean, how how like much belly aching have I raised over Skyward Sword? <laughs> like, you know, this is exactly like that. <laughs> With only having three films in it as opposed to, you know, retconning, what, 15 games? So there, I think you have a little bit more of a leg to stand on as opposed to me just being like, yeah, they ruined my bad monster movie and my good <laughs> horror movie. <laughs> and it's, the, it's the same principle, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I mean, I think that pretty much covers it. Cloverfield, good. 10 Cloverfield, great. Cloverfield Paradox, half of it's pretty damn good. And then it shoots itself in the foot pretty hard. <laughs> Completely cacks its trousers. <laughs> Just sits there with a big old stinky poo. <laughs> Honest to God, if you want to watch Cloverfield Paradox, watch until Tam freezes herself in the, the airlock and then turn it off. And like, I genuinely think you'll have a great time because there's some really, really good body horror. There's some, I mean, even there's some decently clever filmmaking, like the fucking foosball table spinning and like the, the dudes changing. That's some really kind of great ambient storytelling. You know, it doesn't directly apply to everything, but like you can get a better feel for what's going on and it's better than, Oh look, the ship decided to change just to kill somebody. Yeah, like, that's the weird thing about the movie is that it's bad, but it's not, like, it's not so obviously bad in a lot of the ways that we tend to talk about movies on this R. Like, like I... It, it's it's not like, you know, Cowboys and Aliens are just so thuddingly fucking dull. Like, with the exception of The Husband, I wasn't really ever bored. But a lot of that was just because when it stopped being interesting, it was just nonsense. Um, but it wasn't really nonsense enough for me to laugh at, so... <laughs> no, it, it, the, the back half straddles a very, very weird line that just results in a very resounding what the fuck. Yeah, shit, shit's a mess. Um, yeah, no, I, I think... Uh, for a monster movie fan, you know, Cloverfield's definitely worth watching. Uh, I definitely recommend people go out of their way to watch 10 Cloverfield Lane. Excellent, excellent thriller. Uh, Cloverfield Paradox, I mean, like, there are bigger wastes of time, I guess, but I can't really recommend it, so... No, I, I mean, I can't either. I, my statement of watch the first half really applies to people who are like, I want to watch Event Horizon, but I don't want to watch Event Horizon. So just watch the first <laughs> I'm half. I'm fiending of for more Event Horizon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I've been Sean McKinda. Find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKinda. I tweet sometimes. And I'm Jackson Heller. You can find me on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller. I also tweet sometimes uh you can find the podcast at bnh underscore cast on twitter it tweets sometimes and by sometimes i mean like once a week just to let you know that what the episode's out and occasionally if we're like hey here's a bonus episode or you know here's something else going on if you want to get in contact with jackson i the best way to do those on our patreon that's patreon.com slash b-a-d-h cast a dollar a month gets you extra discord five dollar a month gets you extra backlog of bonus episodes and ten dollars a month does get you the ability to request bonus episodes, but we're probably going to put a pause on that. In fact, for what it's worth, we're going to be pausing the entirety of our Patreon coming up here at the end of December. We'll give a better explanation on what that is next week in our standalone to explain everything that's going down. But if you want access to our Discord, toss us a buck. You can come yell at us. If you want our huge backlog of bonus episodes, five bucks, go listen to them. There's some really, really good episodes. And we have a really, really interesting end of year episode coming up. I promise you that. It also, if you're a $10 patron, it gets a little something, something. Thank you so much. Julia, Travis, Pat, Mom, Aunt Summer, y'all are great.
Also, thanks to Lord of the Highway for the use of our theme song. It is Suicide Alter Take off the album High Octane Low Expectations. They're a wonderful band. You should go check them out wherever you can because artists are hurting right now. So please go support their music on Bandcamp, Spotify, buy their music, whatever you got to do. Please go support them. Also, thanks to Roy5 Years Later site.com. There's a little button up in the corner that you can go click on, and you absolutely should. But you should also definitely check out the great writers over there. There's a bunch of really talented people doing a bunch of really talented writing. Next week, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one, boys and girls. Stay tuned. Don't you go into the ground. Don't you go.